answers, and we'll, we'll use the PowerPoint discussion that was on the video to maybe dig a little deeper if we need to. Okay. So the first few questions are anatomic-based, understanding how things look uh, on imaging, on cross examination CT and MRI. So the first five are name these foramina. So there's, these, are the, these are the choices, and the questions are these. Okay. Uh, there's only four on this slide, but there'll be a fifth one coming up. So the next several slides are all questions one through five. And you need to pick which of these answers, A through G, belongs to one, two, three, four, and five in a minute. Sliced a little further, further forward. So these should con these should con this should confirm your initial impressions, or confuse you if you got one wrong. <laughs> so here's an actual view the same things and here are the same numbers and again these should either confirm your suspicions or confuse you if, if you were, weren't quite right Is that enough time? Anybody need, need more time? Okay. And this one, um, it's not A, B, C, it's just two, three, four, five, and six. So there are four images that are based on uh, high T2, high contrast cisternal imaging. And you've got five nerves to choose from, and images six, seven, eight, nine each show one of these cranial nerves. <laughs> these are the nerves. These are the nerves that we're after. Is that good? Enough time? Okay. Um, next, few next few questions are about MRI imaging sequences. So, what is this sequence? Okay, there's a few more. There's 10. Here's 11. contrasty from what it would, it would normally look like. Thirteen. Another um, MRI protocol question. Which of the following techniques is least 
useful when you're imaging the cisternal segments of the cranial nerves. Cis, or some people say kiss, Fiesta, MP Rage, T2 Spin Echo, T2 Space, T1 Post Contrast. This gets into the alphabet soup of MRI imaging. Okay, that enough time? <coughs> All right, um, this is a lateral view of a digital subtraction angiogram. And this is a patient with a CC fistula, a lateral view. So I'm going to show you a bunch of vessels and you're going to and uh, tell me which ones are which. So we've got um, 15 through 90. So we've got five vessels I'd like you to identify. And pick from cavernous sinus, inferior petrosal vein, internal carotid artery, middle cerebral artery, superior ophthalmic vein, and posterior communicating artery. This is a tough one, by the way, because when you get, when you have CC fistula, the blood's going in all kinds of directions, and that confuses things. Because on an angiogram, everything on a this is a, a a planar projectional view, so everything is overlapped. Okay, need, need more time on this one? Is that okay? Okay, so this isn't exact cross-sectional imaging, but we do so much uh, anatomic uh, evaluation, so much of what we do in imaging starts with the anatomy, so I want to be able to identify things on the CTA especially, or an MRA of the intracranial vessels. So this isn't ABC, we just put the name of the vessel as each of those um, seven things. We have, we have all eight things that Enough time? Oh, like okay. Is that good? Almost? Okay, so the next question is the same diagram, but I want you to, to pick the location that is the most common site of aneurysm that causes pupillary dysfunction. are all fairly common places uh, for aneurysms of the circle of bullets to show up. And there's a related question, um, which is the most common overall site for a circle of bullets aneurysm? Not necessarily causing pupillary dysfunction, but taking all comers, which site is the most likely to be a place where an aneurysm shows up? OK, 
Okay. Um, now let's get into some pathology. This is an <coughs> axial T1 post contrast. The arrows are just identifying the pathology. Which of the following is least likely in this patient who presents with multiple cranial neuropathies? This is a spin echo T1 uh, post contrast. And um, a lot of times uh, in imaging, we often talk differentials because the one answer is not often pathognomonic. And so um, knowing what to exclude sometimes is the best you can do. So of these five conditions, which one is likely, least likely to present this way? West Nile virus infection, cryptococcal infection, sarcoidosis, intracranial sarcoidosis, lymphoma, or tuberculosis. Which of the following in this T1 post contrast image, which of the following diagnosis is least likely? Idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease, thyroid orbitopathy, IgG4 related disease, lymphoma, or sarcoid? And again, this is a post contrast T1 with bad suppression. Which of the following diagnoses is least likely in this young adult with acute vision loss? On the top you have a T2 with fat suppression, on the bottom you have a T1 post contrast with fat suppression. Your choices are um, multiple sclerosis, acoporin 4, NMO, MOG, positive NMO, sarcoid, or GPA. Which of the following is most correct regarding this optic pathway lesion? This is a T1 without fat suppression because you see all the, all the fat is still bright. And it's post contrast because you can see that the vessels and the mucosa is bright. So which of the following is most correct? Most patients with this lesion have NF1. Most patients with NF1 have this lesion. This lesion is associated with mild vision loss. Enhancement indicates a higher tumor grade. Okay. 34. What is the best diagnosis? Maybe you can tell from, from the imaging features what kind of a sequence this is. Options are cystic hygroma, lymphangioma, venal lymphatic malformation, cavernous hemangioma, type 1 vascular malformation. You have a CT and an MR. What is the most likely clinical feature that would accompany the presentation of this patient's imaging? And your options are sudden vision loss, painful vision loss, 
Coast of Maine, Capaiole spots, middle-aged female, history of prior radiation therapy. A, a CT image. Which, what subtype of neural, neuronal injury is most likely in this trauma patient who presents with heart <coughs> syndrome? First order preganglionic, second order preganglionic, second order postganglionic, third order postganglionic. Okay, should we, should we go over them? All right, we'll start at the top. Number one. Somebody knows. Let's see. Optic canal. Optic canal. Uh -huh. Two. Superior fissure. Three. Tendum and four. So ovale is um, actually a, a little bit harder to see. Ovale <coughs> goes up and down, whereas vidian and rotundum come forward. So if you're in a coronal, you're going to see rotundum and vidian coming right at you as circles. And ovale is going to be right about here, a, a slice or two back. And it's going to show up as basically a, a gap. It's going to be a vertical gap in the central in the, the central skull base right there. Uh, so I don't, I don't actually show ovale on this one. That's vidian. Rotundum is up and out and lateral. Vidian is down and in. In patients who have a, a very uh, aerated or hyper aerated sphenoid sinus, you'll often see the air of the sinus come between these two. So. You, so if the, if the pterygoid itself is pneumatized, which is, not, um, which is a pretty common variation, you'll actually see a channel of air between separating foramen rotundum and the vidian canal. So here's the same thing. So uh, optic canal, superior fissure. What's the little piece of bone called that separates the optic canal from the superior fissure? Optic strut. Optic strut. And in fact, if you think about the anatomy of the, of the fissure, the superior fissure and the inferior fissure are really a continuous st structure. Um, they're separated by the bone at the top of rotundum. Through a, rotundum goes what? B2. B2. And everything else that's important pretty much goes through the superior fissure. And um, the inferior fissure and rotundum are, are kind of right in line. So if you come out, if you come out of rotundum, it goes right <coughs> into the inferior fissure, and then above that is the superior fissure, and through which go um, three, four, three V one, uh, and four and six. And what's five? So that's that's the pterygopalatine fossa. And it's a, in imaging, it's a really distinctive structure because it's this, little, it's this little pocket of fat that's right smack in the middle of the deep, deep face. And uh, we, we sometimes call it the crossroads of the deep face because it has a pathway to almost everything. It's really close to, it's right directly in front of Vidian. It has a direct connection to Rotundum. So you can get from pterygopalatine fossa, you can get into the central skull base through um, uh, rotundum back in, into the intracranial compartment. It gets into the orbit through the fissure. Um, it actually goes down into the, the oral cavity through the, the pterygoid canal. It has a medial access into the nasal cavity through the, the pseudopalatine foramen here. It has access into the deep face, the masticator space, through the pterygomaxillary fissure. So the pterygopalatine fossa, we often look at that as, a, as, a, as, as one of our um, search points 
when we're looking for perineural tumor because it is a place where so many things cross over. And what you see in CT and MR is just this little pocket of fat. It's not pure fat because there are, there are um, neural structures and some vascular structures in there, uh, and there may be some lymphatic tissue. So it's got a little bit of stuff in it, but when you have perineural tumor, what you see is a fat is effaced by something enhancing it. In the axial... Um, Sorry, on uh, two and three? Oh, on the last one. So what is uh, still the optic canal? So optic canal, yeah. superior fissure. Still superior over fissure. And is that's that rotundum. That's rotundum. Sorry, because uh, I, I thought you pointed to it and said vidian. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. Um, so Mine's vid still rotundum. Yeah. yeah. Think, of, think of vidian as being immediately behind the, the bulk of the pterygopathic process. So if you, put, if, you, if you put your cursor on vidian and then come forward, you should be kind of slight sm smack in or at the bottom part of the pterygopathic okay. fossa. So you can't see vidian on this one anymore. Right. And um, you'll often see a little de depression as, as rotundum is forming along the lateral margin of the sphenoid sinus. And uh, that actually has a name. Um, that they call the, the porous trigeminus is that depression as it's going into an actual canal. So, so vidian, medial and down, rotundum up and out, and then the vidian kind of dumps right here into the pterygopathic fossa. And you can see that as you come forward, the pterygopathic fossa is going to pretty much envelop what's coming out of rotundum right into it as well. So both vidian and rotundum dump into that space that, that becomes the pterygopathic fossa. So um, if you, in the right, uh, in the right uh, slice, you can't see the chiasm forming because the optic canal really is coming at a, at a pretty steep angle. So the, the optic canals do come in angled toward each other like this. And a rookie mistake is to see this and think it's the optic canal. But one thing to remember is the fissure looks like it's kind of, it's a little short thing, it's coming straight back, whereas the optic canals are coming in angled toward each other to make the chiasm. Rotundum is just a little short canal right here, and below it is the vidian. Vidian and rotundum can be a little bit hard to separate on axial, but vidian has this characteristic long kind of sickle shape to it. In fact, in some, in some patients, the vidian is more conspicuous than rotundum, and another rookie mistake is to call, maybe that's the mistake I made, is, is to call this rotundum, when it's the because it's the most distinctive little circle that you'll see, but the vidian is a longer canal and sometimes a little more obvious. So vidian is kind of a long sickle shape, whereas rotundum is a little short thing. They both dump into the pterygopathic fossa. This is the upper part of the pterygopathic fossa. This is kind of the, the main bulk part of the pterygopathic fossa. You can see the fat inside of it. Um, so this, uh, these are, these are, this is one of these sequences that is very heavily T2 weighted. The purpose of the sequence um, is to really show the cistern, the cisterns and whatever's running in them, vessels and veins in particular. It's not great at looking at parenchymal detail. Um, so what's, what's this nerve here? So five is the easiest one to see. It's a big fat chunk. Um, as it comes in toward this little CSF space here, you'll sometimes see the fibers start to separate. So you'll often see little, um, little individual fibers kind of floating within the CSF right there. What is this CSF pocket here called? That's Meckel's Cave. And, you'll, and, and it, th uh, this is, these two, on almost any sequence, these are normal findings. And one of the things that we look for, for like a, uh, maybe a meningioma or a schwannoma that's occupying five in Meckles Cave, when Meckles Cave is missing, you'll hear us use the term a winking Meckles Cave because it's, it's missing on one side. Uh, but that's a structure that's very reliably, 
reliably seen in association with five. Um, this is a sagittal. You can see the belly of the pons. And there's a structure that's cutting it up at this angle right there. There's really only one thing that does that. And what's that? Six. That's six. It can be hard to find, um, but if you know where it runs, really there's nothing that's going in that direction. All the veins and arteries are usually kind of coming at oblique or more transverse angles. And it's, even though it's a very small thing, within um, T2 weighted imaging, you can usually pick it out of a crowd. Um, eight. Three. Three. So three is a, is a pretty big nerve, and you can usually see it um, quite easily. Uh, that it runs right between the P1 and the SCA segments right there. Four also runs in the same space. Four runs out lateral here. It's a much smaller nerve, and I think it's really hard to, to reliably see it on, on a coronal. Um, so what's, what was this, in the, this one then on nine? Four. four, I don't think you can necessarily always see four. If you see something that runs right there, decussating along the back, you can, see, that's probably a pretty good, um, a pretty good uh, identification, but I find four is not always reliably identified. It's a very small nerve. Okay, so this is just some bread and butter imaging. What's this? Fat's bright. Mucosa is not enhancing. Fluid is dark. So this is a T1 spin echo. This this is this is one of your your, your primary non-contrast sequences. So this is a T1 spin echo. Coronal. In this case, uh, we have CSF is dark. Notice how, how the, the so fluid is dark, very brightly enhancing mucosa and muscles. The fat is dark. So what's this one? T1 weighted suppression. Right. So this is a T1 weighted spin echo with contrast and fat suppression. This is this is one of our other uh, other core sequences because it brings out pathology, but it suppresses the fat, which has a lot of signal, so that pathology becomes more conspicuous. An actual image, vitreous CSF, very bright. Fat is dark. You actually have two choices on this one, and you can you get credit for either one. So, what are the two choices? T two with fat suppression. So T two with fat suppression, and the other option would be a stir, which stands for short tau inversion recovery. It's it's, it's a different kind of a pulse sequence. So both of these give you. T2 fluid and usually pathology heavy signal, um, but it makes the fat go away. Spin echo T2, if you don't, um, fat, so if you have just a plain old spin echo T2 without fat suppression, the way that T2 is done in, a, in order to get it, um, T2 can be very slow to acquire. And the technique that allows us to get a lot of T2 uh, slices quickly actually brings out a fair amount of fat signal with it. So if you do a T2 spin echo without fat suppression, all your fat is going to be really, really bright. So if you want to see uh, pathology emphasized, you do a T2 with spin echo, but then you add fat suppression on top of it um, uh, to make the signal go away. A stir sequence is a different kind of a pulse sequence, and it doesn't have any fat excitation at all, so, so you don't have to suppress it. Um, the issue with fat suppression is it's an additional it's an additional gradient uh, that takes. Uh, I mean, if you if you were to think about it from a point of view of like electrical engineering and an oscilloscope, there, there's actually a signal spike in the fat when you do T two signal when you do T two acquisition with spin echo. When the tech is doing the scan, they actually pull up uh, a spectrum and they can see a spike of signal that is resonating at fat and they put a suppression pulse right on that spike to make the fat signal go away, but just a very narrow suppression pulse. So the fat signal goes away, but nothing else does. The problem is, is that that depends on a very homogeneous magnetic field. And when you put metal in there, or if you have other factors to get in the way, people have braces or implants, the, 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 the magnetic field gets irregular and your suppression pulse is not always perfect at taking out just the fat spike of signal, and it can miss the fat spike and suppress other things. So when you have a fat, when you have a T2 
sequence is fat suppression, well, the, same, the same thing applies with any fat suppression, the fat suppression can be inconsistent or it can be wrong, and you might get accidental fat signal and something else gets suppressed. So you have to be able to look at these things and know whether it's, it's, the fat suppression is, is working or not. The stir doesn't have any fat signal to begin with, so there's nothing to suppress. So it's a much more reliable sequence in, in determining what's fat and what's not. So we usually will do one, one plane in stir and one plane in T2 fat sat with suppression. So we'll do one of, the, one of these and one of these, usually, usually a, a, an axial here and then the coronal fat suppression. You, you get a little bit better spatial resolution with spinning wheel, so we like to have at least one of these because you get a little bit better detail, but we do at least one of them with the stir just in case the fat suppression has a problem. So this is kind of, this is kind of a, an alphabet soup. Um, four of these are T2 sequences and two of them are T1 and this probably isn't all that fair and an MP rage is it's a variation of how to do T1 imaging and um, the, the basic T1 sequence which is a spin echo is the one that's, is, is the one that was originally developed it's the most commonly used but it has some the T1 spin echo can have issues with um, phase artifact when you have flowing vessels um, at 3T especially and so, um, if you want to have a T1 sequence that doesn't have the same kinds of, of motion artifact, an MP rage is a T1 sequence that has some advantages. Um, but it is essentially a T1 weighted sequence. Of all of these, the T2s are the most important when you're looking at, at, um, at cisternal cranial nerves. Now, three of these, the, the KISS, the Fiesta, and the T2 space. So A, B, and E are all pretty much the same thing. These are actually vendor terms. It's kind of unfair that, that Siemens and GE, which are the, are the two main manufacturers we have experience with, they use different acronyms for their imaging sequence. The bottom line is, is the, the KISS, the Fiesta, and the T2 space are sequences that are heavily, heavily T2. They really emphasize the fluid signal and the parenchyma kind of is just a uh, um, amorphous black. Um, but they really give you great cisternal, uh, cisternal imaging. So, so the KISS, the Fiesta, and the T2 space are of that kind, what we call heavily T2 weighted. Uh, a plain old spin, a spin echo T2 is not bad because you can still see the CSF pretty well. It's more prone uh, to pulsation artifact in the CSF, so it can be a little bit harder to see. You can't get quite as thin as sequences with a, with, a, with a spin echo T2, whereas the, the T2 space and the Fiesta and the KISS gives you really super thin submillimeter slices. Um, if you have pathology that's enhancing the, the post contrast would be useful, but of all these, the MP rage without contrast would be the least useful because when you're looking at cisternal structures, the CSF on, T, on T, just plain old T1, the CSF is darkish, the nerves are darkish, you're not gonna be able to see anything. So of, of these, the infrared is probably the least useful. Okay, so an angiogram is performed by putting a catheter in um, the, the internal carotid artery in the neck. Usually, so you put the catheter up into, um, on the right side of the brachiocephalic, then in the carotid or on the left in the common carotid. And usually when you're doing an internal injection, you like to get the catheter past the bifurcation and the catheters have a little angled tip, so you move the tip around so that it angles into the internal. Usually it's, it's kind of pointed back and lateral. Slide it into the first couple centimeters of the internal, and then do a, an injection with a, with, a, with a power injector, and take a series of images over the, you know, the next 10 seconds. Um, with CT, you can get really nice pictures in cross-section. The problem is that it only takes a couple of seconds to get from the first instant of injection to where you're filling out the arteries and even getting into the veins. The intracranial circulation is very low resistance. You fill up, um, you fill up uh, the arteries and the veins very, very quickly. You only have a couple of second window. CT and certainly MR, you don't have enough temporal resolution. You can't image fast enough to see things go. So if you need to see 
the detail of an early arterial filling, the only way to do that is with a, an angiogram, with a, 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 a digital subtraction angiogram. So the contrast is injected into the ICA. So here's your internal carotid artery right here. It comes up, and then right here, usually what you see is a nice, pretty siphon. So you see the S-curve of, of the cavernous sinus coming up to the, the terminal ICA. But in this case, you have a big blob of contrast filling what structure? What 16? Cavernous sinus, because this patient has a CC fistula. And in addition to filling the cavernous sinus, you have pressurized now that venous space with arterial flow. So you're filling two things that normally shouldn't fill on an angiogram. Um, one of them is this structure here, which is filling anterograde. What's this? That's the serop superior ophthalmic vein. So this venous contrast is actually going forward this way, filling this structure, and it's really big in addition to filling arterial phase. You notice how the arterial phase is still pretty early. Most of the arterial tree is not filled up, and you already got the cavernous sinus and the superior ophthalmic vein filling. There's one more structure that's filling up normally. That's this thing right here coming off the cavernous sinus. It's actually flowing downward. You know what 17 is? Yeah, that's the inferior petrosal vein. That's one more venous uh, piece of, of evidence that this thing is a, a clearly abnormal arterial venous connection. Um, and what does that make? 15? Yeah, so those are branches of MCA. Because this is a lateral view, they're coming out at you. Um, uh, so the, so uh, and then if, if I, yeah, I had to put an arrow on this, what's that right there, this little artery right there? That's PCOM. PCOM comes straight off the back of the terminal ICA. Okay. So I'll just point to it. What's 20? ACOM. ACOM. 22? A1. A1. 21? 2? ICA. ICA. PCOM. PCOM. So, which famous aneurysm causes um, people, in, people involved third nerve palsy? B. So, yes, yeah, so what's B? We, we, know that, um, we know that PCOM is the classic aneurysm, but what we don't often remember to, to emphasize is that it's actually not a PCOM aneurysm per se, it's an ICA aneurysm that is arising at the origin of the PCOM. This is, this is where you usually see them. So if you, had, if you had an aneurysm, it would show up right here, sticking up, usually sticking off the back of the, the terminal ICA where the PCOM is coming off. So that's the most common place to see. It, it's technically, it's, a, it's an ICA aneurysm, but we call it a PCOM aneurysm. And what's the most common place for aneurysms in general? It's gonna be, um, ACOM right here. I don't have the I don't have the MCA bifurcation. That would be the other most common place uh, if you if you had the if you had the MCAs. Uh, okay, so this is a T1 post contrast. The abnormality is lots and lots of enhancement filling the cisternal spaces, perimesens phallic, um, interpeduncular, supercellular, going out of the MCA cisterns. All kinds of enhancement filling up everything. Um, this is a, a pattern that we would term, uh, well, if you were to describe the, the, the just a generic pattern of involvement, what, what, what would you, what would you, term would you use? Leptomeningeal. This is, this is a leptomeningeal process of some kind. It's either leptomeningeal inflammation or, or it's a leptomeningeal tumor. Um, so which of these is least likely to give you a leptomeningeal pro, uh, a manifestation? And this is a really striking, extreme manifestation. Well, certainly fungal uh, meningitis will do this. Um, sarcoidosis um, and lymphoma. Lymphoma and granulomatous diseases have a lot of imaging overlap. If you hear yourself saying sarcoid um, uh, or uh, fungal disease or TB, in the same sentence you're probably gonna say, in addition to infection, we consider lymphoma.
lymphoma, because those, those have a lot of imaging overlap. So granulomas diseases, granulomas infections, and lymphoma, these have a lot of imaging overlap. And lymphomeningeal manifestations is a common thing for the that one. Whereas West Nile virus is more of an encephalitis. I wouldn't really give you this kind of an extreme lymphomeningeal enhancing picture. Okay, T1 post contrast, and this patient has lots of lots of abnormalities. They, get, they have the muscle involved, they have the optic nerve involved, and if you look closely, they even have intracranial disease. They've got a mass in the supracellular region, and there's even some linear enhancement right along. What what normally runs right there? That's third nerve. So you've got somebody with lots and lots of, of multifocal, pretty extreme enhancement. So when you think about things that give you multifocal orbital and possible intracranial disease, um, which is the least likely? What's that? Thyroid. Thyroid, yeah. So thyroid has, has a pretty specific um, orbital manifestation. And I don't know that I've seen orbit give you this kind of optic nerve or intracranial disease. Um, certainly, uh, idiopathic disease, IgG4, which in some ways we almost think of like a kind of variation of, of a pseudotumor. Uh, this would be a great look for lymphoma, for sure. This, this one happened to be sarcoid. Uh, but, but any of these, uh, of, of these inflammatory conditions could present this way. Okay, so here we have a young adult. We have a T2. T1 post contrast. On the right, we have nerve enhancement, a little bit of swelling um, because it's it's effacing the, the normal cuff of CSF that you see around the optic nerve. Orbit took look pretty pretty clean, and then on the post contrast, you see it's enhancing the swollen nerve, normal on this side, and at least on this picture, the rest of the orbit looks pretty good. So you know we're targeting optic neuritis. Which of which of the following is least likely to present with what appears to be an isolated optic neuritis. So this, this is where I'm, I'm getting, getting out of my territory, because now I'm trying to pretend like I'm an ophthalmologist and I, I know how these things present, but um, you'll have to tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think GPA presents this way, does it? Not usually. I mean, you, you can get an optic neuritis with, with GPA, but, but these other ones would, would all be, um, certainly the, the, the demyelinating conditions would be pretty typical for op acute optic neuritis, and we've seen sarcoid present with acute op optic neuritis as well. So I thought E was the right answer. Judith, is, there, is, there, is that the best answer? Okay. Plus, I wanted, I wanted to, to, to pretend like I knew. <laughs> okay, so what's, what's the optic pathway lesion here? You have a T1. Post contrast because um, you have all the enhancement of the vascular structures and the mucosa, which have these big, fat, bilateral optic nerves, chiasm, and tract. So this is a optic pathway glioma. So the question is, which of these statements is the most accurate? So I guess I'd say, what percentage of patients with optic pathway glioma end up also having NF1? Well, so this, this is where uh, you'll probably have to help me out a little bit, but in, in my reading, uh, most patients, now, it's, there's definitely an association, but it's a minority of patients. If a patient presents with optopathic glioma, fewer than half are going to actually have NF1. Is that right, Judith? You know what? I don't know the numbers. It seems like it's you know, 15, 30%. And the same is true of patients who have NF1, most of them don't have optic glioma. Optopathic glioma. Now, certainly many of them do because there's a clear association, but most don't. So I think that these two are the A and B are not true. It's an association, but it's but it's not most. Um, these patients often have surprisingly minor vision uh, impairment. They can have these big, huge masses, and their vision seems to be not that bad. Uh, again, I'm, I'm getting into your realm a little bit. Uh, since I don't see these patients myself, but in my readings, um, and when we see the patients who have optic pathway lesions, I'm often amazed at how well the patients are described to be able to see. 
Um, so, so C is the right answer. And enhancement, unlike other glial um, ne uh, neoplasms, um, enhancement does not correlate with grade of tumor. Um, you can think, almost think of these as like um, pilocytic astrocytoma. So the classic posterior fossa pediatric brain tumor. Pilocytic astrocytomas have an intensely enhancing nodule, but that's not a high-grade malignancy. That is one of the features of that tumor. So optic pathway gliomas are a little bit like, you can see, think of them as kind of like these um, grade one um, glial tumors in that they can have quite a bit of enhancement and not be higher grade malignancy. This is kind of a, kind of a paradox here. All right, so here we have what kind of a sequence? So it's T2, and the fat is dark. So it's T2 with fat suppression, either spinaco or a stir. Um, and you could say that, that all of these answers are right, but one, right? So what, but, but I, I use the word best on purpose because I think there's one best answer, maybe two best answers. What, what, what's, your, what's your best answer? What'd you pick? That? D. D? Unfortunately, that's the, that's the one wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is because of these. This is multilocular with fluid layers, which means it's, this is a repeated hemorrhage multilocular lesion. I would call this a venal lymphatic malformation. It's a, it's a, malfor it's a malformative lesion and it often presents in kids. Uh, it can have these serial events. They will often have sudden vision loss because of hemorrhage. And over time, you, you build up these, these, these fluid layers. <clears throat> these two terms are kind of falling out of favor because they're, they're old style. They're 20th century terms. And um, they don't reflect the pathology as well as we understand them. And, and they have the OMA in them, which makes it sound um, proliferative or neoplastic, which, which these aren't. These, these are malformations. So we try to get away from cystic hygroma and lymphangioma. Um, venal lymphatic malformation is probably the most you know, pathologically accurate term. Um, these are uh, usually type 1 vascular malformations because uh, they may or may not have any venous component. Now, there is overlap. They can, have, they, can, they can have venous component or not. Clearly, they have some kind of vascular connection because they bleed, um, but um, they can be either type 1 or, or type 2. Now, if they have a varix in them, and we've seen some of these patients, they're pretty uncommon, but these dramatic varices where a patient um, holds their breath, and in about 20 seconds, they can make their eye pop out by filling this varix up with, with venous blood. Um, those would be the type 2 malformations. They can have a very similar pathology to these, uh, what we would originally uh, we used to call lymphangiomas, um, because they do have this this um, venous connection. But these are these are malformations, and they're distinctly different from a cavernous hemangioma. This is also a bad, not not a great word because um, they are also malformations and not not tumors. But the cavernous hemangioma is a, a, an adult lesion. It's very discrete. It's encapsulated. They they don't hemorrhage. They don't have calcification in them, and it's it's a it's a different beast. Okay, so here you have a CT and an MR post contrast with this very characteristic, what we call tram track calcification, meaning it's something that is encasing the optic nerve and it's enhancing on, on a post contrast T1. So, what is this? Men meningioma. So, now this is me again pretending like I'm, I'm a clinician and trying to imagine. What kind of clinical feature might accompany this? So what's the best answer here? Well, does their vision loss happen suddenly? Usually it's very gradual, right? Um, and unlike acute optic neuritis, it tends to be painless. Um, this, is, this is a complete red herring. What, where does this come from? There was a, the last oral conference we showed a patient that had McCune-Albright. Mm -hmm. 
tribulation spots. I was trying to throw you off with maybe some sort of neurofibromatosis idea. Um, this is the typical demographic here. Now, this one, Judith, I imagine that radiation could induce a meningioma. We certainly see it intracranial. It's probably not the most likely. <laughs> Have you seen radiation induced intraorbital meningiomas? Uh, no, not an optic nerve sheath meningioma. Yeah. I've seen from radiation in general, but not yeah. nerve sheath. So I thought D was the answer I was, I was looking for here. Okay, so this is a trauma patient, and they have a, a fractured transverse process. And by the way, um, can you recognize the level by the morphology? What's that? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you a hint. The transverse foramen is this little tiny thing that is not being used. That's why it's tiny. One of the cervical vertebra doesn't have the vertebral arteries in its foramen. It's a vestigial foramen. At which level is that? Seven. Seven. So, this is, so you can actually tell seven by its morphology. Um, we have a transverse process fracture here, and this patient presented with a Horner syndrome. Now, of course, with trauma and Horner's, we get a CTA and everything. Um, this person's CTA was normal, and this was the cause of the Horner's. So what kind of Horner's is this? And, 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 and any volunteers? So, well, well so I, I, did, I did bring a diagram of this. So down here, you're actually getting the second order neurons. So the answer here is the second order pregaglionic. First order would be the, uh, the neurons that come from the hypothalamus down to the ciliospinal center. So, so the brain to spinal cord is the first order. The second order are the ones that come out um, with a brachial plexus and then ascend toward the superior cervical ganglion. And then the third orders are the ones that take off after that. If you chose C, you actually get a minus point because there is no such thing. The second orders are pregaglionic by definition. This, this, this one is, is just is my fault. I was wondering if you had some new anatomical structure that I hadn't heard of. <laughs> nope. Okay, so here, here's the diagram. So for pregaglionic, um, the pathway goes from the hypothalamus down to the ciliospinal center. So it comes down here, synapses there, and then it comes out up to the superior cervical ganglion. So, so and there are two ganglia in here to remember that they're named. There's the stellate ganglion, and there's a superior cervical ganglion. The ganglion part of this term is actually, this refers to the superior cervical ganglion, not the stellate ganglion, which is kind of a combined superior thoracic ganglion with, the, with an, another ganglion down here. So when, when we say the ganglion, we mean this one right here. So you have first order nerves here that are preganglionic, pre and second order preganglionic here. And, and when you have a trauma or something in the, in the lung apex, um, that's going to be the second order. And the, th the third order, postganglionic, are after that. So the lesions that do this, so the first order, brain and spinal cord, brachial plexus, paraspinous, mediastinum, lung apex, those are going to be the second order preganglionic corners. Whereas the, po the postganglionic, they come from the superior cervical ganglion along the carotid plexus into the skull base and kind of follow V1 into the eye, into the orbit. So preganglionic, there's the ganglion, and then it follows the artery up and into the orbit that way. So for those, we see it with dissection, um, arteriopathies like FMD, uh, masses, glomus tumors. Okay. <laughs>